legacy. You know, uh, it says the lines that fall onto me in pleasant places. And when David said that, he was actually speaking from a geographical standpoint. He says, my lot, my portion. What he means by that is exactly what a lot of homeowners experience as well. When we talk about our lots and our blocks, the same thing. And the idea is that uh, God has given us a tremendous heritage. And he's given us a tremendous uh, inheritance. And that's what we talked about yesterday, if you were here with us in this uh, ministry, in this series that we have for, throughout the week. And it's the same thing. God has given us such blessings in his word. And it's for, uh, incumbent upon us to make sure that we're delving into the word and really studying. So it's great to be amongst you and uh, to have some great conversations with you as well. Well, we mentioned uh, in our uh, discussion uh, yesterday, the series uh, topic was introduced as the promises of God. And we talked about the fact that God promised the nation of Israel that he would bring them into a large land, a good land, flow with milk and honey. And God has done that same thing with us. And so we trust that that is a help and a blessing to you. So this morning I'd like to take a look at another portion of our uh, uh, series. And that is going to be taking a look at this. Not just the promises that we have. These are just some of the things I hit my, my clicker when I shouldn't have hit it. And so this is how technology is, right? And we want to be reminded again of the promises of God. So this great uh, little ditty that uh, we often hear about. Every promise in his book is mine, every chapter, every verse, every line. All are blessings of his love divine, all the promises of his book are mine. And we need to really stand upon the promises. And we, I'm so glad the song leader had that this morning. I know some of you said, hey, that would be a perfect uh, hint for that. And so that song leader and others are listening very much to it. Okay. Well, some of God's promises to, and blessings to us to see us through uh, the difficult times that we go through in our lives. We all go through difficult times. There's no question about that. We all have challenges in our walk with the Lord. We know Christ is our Savior. Uh, these are part of uh, Christian life, part of the lessons that we learn in the school of God. If you've not trusted Christ as Savior, sometimes he uses these events to draw you to himself. There's that point that we need to realize that we can't do things in our own strength and we have to finally put up the white flag and say, I surrender. And when we do that, God comes in a very powerful way and he shows you that he is there to help you and gives you his salvation. And we looked at the uh, main verse from 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 3 and 4. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Life is salvation. Godliness is sanctification. God wants us to live a life that's pleasing to him. And he gives us the necessary resources to do that. Uh, we have in his word a tremendous uh, uh, guide, what we would call yesterday, we call the survival guide, uh, to help us through this life. And we trust that you're taking full advantage of all that God has for you. And so yesterday we focused on God's promises to us. God's promises to you. We looked at Joshua chapter 1, and we realized that as we look at that, it's a wonderful spiritual picture of the Christian life. Back in the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 1, the nation of Israel was about to go into the land of promise, but there were some prerequisites that God's people had to abide by in order for them to enter into this inheritance. God had provided it for them. He said he would take them to it. He's the God who is the God who promises. He's the all-promising God. And he said he would do that, bring them in. Uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, he says, I'm going to bring you to a large land, and a good land, just as we've mentioned. And so he brought them to the very brink of that. That was important for them to make sure that they understood they had a land to possess. It's important for Christians to understand they have spiritual blessings to possess. And then it's also important to understand that they have a law to obey. God gives us his word to obey his word so that we find the blessings of obedience to his word. We live in a life of holiness. It's pleasing to God. And God there uh, shows us special things from his word. I always like looking at that verse in Psalm 103. It says this. He made his ways known to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. And when you first look at that verse in Psalm 103, you think with a broad brush, well, that's a wonderful thing. He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. But really, that verse is a rebuke to the nation of Israel. Moses was a servant of the Lord, and he had you know, special understanding of the way God operated, God worked. So the scripture says he made known his ways to Moses, but only 
his act to the children of Israel. All that the nation of Israel could see were the overt actions and manifestations of God's power and glory, but didn't understand the reasons behind these things, the cause and effect. And so Moses, who had an audience with the Lord because he lived a holy life and a godly life, understood why God did the things he did. He made known his ways unto Moses. But Israel, on the other hand, wasn't doing that. They weren't uh, abiding by his word. They weren't obeying his word. And all they could see was some of the outward manifestations of God's power and glory. So when we study God's word and we obey it and embrace his promises, and like Samuel, don't let any of the words drop to the ground, as we looked at 1 Samuel 3, 319, we make sure that uh, God's promise in our minds, God's promises will not fail, 1 Kings 8, 56. We looked at those yesterday. Then we understand there's a real strength and power in the Christian life, and it helps us through our difficult times. And so even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And that's what we want to focus on this morning. Yesterday was his promises to me. Today I'd like to focus on these things as we consider as we entered into our inheritance. What are some of those uh, key points? Well, his presence with me and his protection of me. His presence with me and his protection of me. And I mentioned yesterday that uh, I'd like to give some of the biblical teaching, the foundation of these ideas with uh, the points that you see behind me on the board. And then illustrate it from the pages of Scripture. The best thing to do is open that Bible up and study that Word. That's why we named our ministry Know the Word. Because when we understand God's Word and we stand on these things, we have a great strength and power in the Christian life. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 reminds us that these are not just interesting stories. God didn't just make up these stories with moral lessons. Read what the scripture says in the New Testament about the Old Testament. Paul said to the Corinthians, now all these things happen. He's telling the veracity, the truthfulness of God's word. These things occurred to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, our warning, that uh, upon rather whom upon the ends of the ages have come. That we might understand these things. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11 tells us these actual these things actually happen. And then in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, one of my favorite verses, the nation of Israel had disobeyed the Lord. God allowed another nation, the Babylonians, to come in and decimate the country, tear down the temple. And for 70 years they were in the land of Babylon. That's called the Babylonian captivity in the history of the Old Testament. And after they fulfilled that term, so to speak, of 70 years, God let them come back. He used a king who was not an Israelite, but a Persian king, Cyrus of all things, a Persian king, to let them go back to the land. And when they got there, there they saw the temple and the walls of Jerusalem all broken down. That's what Ezra and Nehemiah and all those books in that section are all about. God bringing his people back to ground zero, if you, if you will getting them back established, reestablished in their lives as a nation. A spiritual picture for you and for me. Now, sometimes we stray off the course. We've taken things in in this world and allowed influences, wrong influences come in and move us off the center. And so God has to bring us back after he kind of maybe spanks us a little bit in a good way. As many as I love, I chasten, says Revelation chapter 3. So God has this wonderful way of uh, showing his goodness to us, but also his severity. That's what Romans talks about, the goodness and severity of God. And so the temple had to be rebuilt, the walls had to be rebuilt, and the people there sometimes got discouraged when they were rebuilding their lives as a nation. But then God came in through the ministry of Haggai, a younger man, or rather an older man, and then Zechariah, a younger man, and to encourage God's people. And in a series of visions they received, they took those that information, they shared it with God's people. And one of those encouraging points was this. Don't trust in your own strength. Don't do it without the Lord. This is what God says to you, and this is what God is saying to you and to me here today. The very words of Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. 
This is the word to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen. And God can give you the help. He can restore the years the locusts have eaten. He can make the glory of the latter temple to be greater than the former. He can give you beauty for ashes, all those wonderful restoration verses. So no matter how far a person has strayed from the things of God, God's arm is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Your iniquities have separated you from your God. That's what God had to tell the nation of Israel. Now, this is not a negative message. This is a positive message. There is no one beyond the reach of God's forgiveness. Amen. And we have a track in the back. I know the word uh, for those that weren't here yesterday, we mentioned we have a table in the back, various uh, tracks along those lines. One of them is the depths of God's forgiveness. God can save anybody, no matter who you are. God can restore you, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. And the wonderful promise that we have in God's Word, those promises that never fail, to make sure that those promises don't drop to the ground, the words of God don't drop to the ground, as we talked about yesterday, to make sure that we understand that His presence, if you're a believer, is with you, and His protection is up over you, uh, of you. So it's important to know these things. And so just as God encouraged the nation of Israel, He encouraged you here today. So yesterday it was His promises to me, Today, we're going to focus on his presence with me and his protection of me. And uh, we want to bring through a number of different scriptures that teach this. We referred to this yesterday in Hebrews chapter 13 and verses 5 and 6. This is an interesting verse, isn't it? Because it's a little bit of a rebuke to us. Sometimes we get our hands too much around, you know, the, the worldly good. You know, I remember uh, hearing the story of a missionary. I got this from a radio Bible class in RBC ministry illustration, but you know, the missionaries overseas in some of the places like uh, South America and Africa, when they wanted to catch a monkey, they would take a gourd, alright, gourd has those seeds in it or whatever, or nut or whatever in it, they would hollow it out, and they would put a hole in it that would be just big enough for a monkey to get his hand in. Then they would put a nut inside that gourd, and they would put that gourd out there, and then the monkey would want that nut that's in there so badly that he'd put his hand in there. But once he got his hand in there and got a hold of that nut that was in there, he had a fist like that. He couldn't get his hand out of that hole. It was too big. And he was more interested in the thing that was in there than his freedom and letting it go. You know, sometimes uh, with this world, we're told, right, First John chapter 2, verses 15, 17, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the... Eyes uh, of private life. It's not of the Father, but it's of the world. Sometimes we grasp a little too hard those things and not let them go. And sometimes it's to our own demise, our own detriment. So we need to make sure that we're not hanging on to those things of the world. But rather, as this verse says, don't let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So that you may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. What can man do unto me? It's a great verse. Just a reminder to us. Don't get locked in on the things of the world. Doesn't mean you have to live poverty. I mean, Abraham was blessed. A lot of these people were blessed. Job was blessed. He was a righteous person. Scripture tells us uh, in the book of Matthew, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, all these things will be added unto you. That's, that's not the idea that you take up the vow of poverty when you become a Christian. But the thing is to keep the focus on the Lord and follow Him every step of the way. Amen. And these spiritual promises are better than all the riches of the world. Amen. The psalmist Asaph said, Psalm 73, says, Some people have more than heart could wish. And uh, talks about the description of the ungodly who are wealthy beyond belief. He says, I would have fainted. But what's it say in that Psalm 73? It was true, these things were too painful me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I saw their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. And right on through he goes through and identifies every aspect of his foolish thinking of the covetousness and the envy he had of those that had great riches. And he says, whom have I in heaven but thee? And there's nothing more I desire other than thee. His focus was the Lord. He said, oh, I was so foolish to get swept up in the current of this world. Don't be foolish to be caught up in this, the current of this world. Take the words of Hebrews chapter 13 to heart. 
and don't let them, like Samuel, make sure that they're not dropping to the ground. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. And we read these verses yesterday. Joshua 1, 9, Have not I commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be disdained, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wonderful promises from God's word. His promise of his presence with me. And so we're going to be looking at these things. And uh, as we launch into Joshua, I mean, rather, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, you can turn to that portion now, 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Let me focus on these words in Isaiah 43. We're talking about help and hope for hard times. The broader topic of the promises of God. But now says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. Camp on that for a second. You've trusted the Lord as your Savior. He says, you are mine. Amen. He's got an inheritance in you. That's right. Amen is right. Yeah. Paul prayed for the Ephesians. The first, there's two major prayers in Ephesians, the epistle of Ephesians. And the first one is in chapter 1. He says that you might know what is the hope of your calling, that you might know what is the hope of your calling. And his, speaking Christ, his inheritance in the saints. Christ's inheritance in you. He owns us. If we know him as a Savior. You are mine. So therefore, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the water, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flames scorch you. And that's easier said <laughs> than done, I guess, is what you say. Has there anybody in this room ever felt like you were drowning under the cares, concerns of life? Here's one. Overwhelmed and not knowing which way to turn. Hit by the problems of life that come upon you suddenly without any warning. Well, that's what we're going to look at this morning from the life of King Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. I hope you brought your Bibles. If you've not, you can always go back and take a look at these verses and study them. But 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, brings this out. It's the principle that's underscored in Matthew, chapter 28, when he says, Lo, I am with you always. God is always there as a resource to call out. So no matter what the problem is, our first resort should not be, okay, what should... This, uh, what did some other person do in this situation? It's calling out to the Lord for his help. And 2 Chronicles chapter 20 brings us through. So let's read the first uh, 12 or 13 verses of this portion together. Beginning then at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. It ha happened after this that the people of Moab, with the people of Ammon and others with them, besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord, and from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and he said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying if disaster comes upon us, sword, and judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in your temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Now here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, and I love these words, neither or no, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Amen. And all Judah with their little 
sons and wives that are chosen stood before the Lord. Well, what an interesting account. As a matter of fact, you know, the kings of Israel, you don't have too many chapters written about one king, but in Jehoshaphat, there's five chapters about the life of Jehoshaphat. God, in a sense, is putting the spotlight on his life and saying, take a closer look here. I'm going to expand his life here in the pages of Scripture and give you a character profile of this great king. And in chapter 17, when he is introduced in the pages of Scripture, it says that he followed the ways of David, his father. Now, David wasn't his father, his physical father, but he was his descendant. And he obeyed the Lord. And when he obeyed the Lord, God gave great prosperity to the nation of Israel. Tremendous success. And it says that Lord, the Lord honored him with riches and uh, honor in abundance. Tremendous amount of riches and abundance because he followed in the ways of the Lord. And uh, the nation was militarily uh, strong. The really ruler left us here for our nation, right? <laughs> and all that was part of Jehoshaphat's life. That's chapter 17. But interestingly, because of the riches in abundance and his honor and all that, he made a foolish decision and he joined forces with wicked King Ahab. Just a real quick history lesson right here. The nation of Israel was one nation under David and Solomon, and then they had a civil war. And they split into two parts. The northern part was made up of ten tribes and was also called Israel. It gets you a little confused, but the whole nation is Israel. But the top part of the nation, the ten tribes, uh, the northern part, they were also called Israel. The southern portion was called Judah. And so they had kings in either one of those. And all the kings of the northern part of Israel were all rotten to the core, all 22 of those kings. Instead, Judah had some good kings and some bad kings. Of those 20 plus kings, eight of them were good, including Jehoshaphat. So Jehoshaphat was a good king, solid king, one of those eight in the southern portion. Ahab was absolutely wicked. He had married Jezebel. We know that what that name means, right? Jezebel, and what that connotes. And foolishly, Jehoshaphat, even though everything was going well in his life, he makes a marriage alliance with King Ahab. And because of that close connection to this worldly, wicked king, Jehoshaphat got pulled into this vortex and got caught up with the problems of King Ahab. And some armies were coming against the northern nation of Israel, and so Ahab cunningly brought Jehoshaphat into this alliance, and Jehoshaphat, as a believer, went along with it. You can read all this in chapter 18. So chapter 17, great chapter. Chapter 18 is when he takes a plunge. I don't know why it is, but some of us may be going just fine. The sailing spiritually is going fine, and we just put the left foot in the bucket, and we trip and stumble all over. We don't know why we do it. We just do it. We're people. We're, we're that way. God remembers our frame. We're dust. I mean, we're, we make foolish decisions. And Jehoshaphat made a foolish decision right here. And he's at the battlefield, and before he goes out there, Ahab says, hey, listen, guys, i got a great idea. You go out to the battlefield, you be dressed up in your kingly uh, garb, and I'm going to stay back here, I'm going to disguise myself in street clothes. When I was little, we used to call them play clothes. You know, play clothes. And Jehoshaphat agrees to it. And he goes out to the battlefield, and the Syrians who are doing battle against uh, the nation of Israel, the northern portion, they think that Jehoshaphat is Ahab from a distance. And so they say, don't do any more fighting, go after Ahab, who's actually Jehoshaphat. And Ahab is probably snickering off to the side, saying, I fool them and him, Jehoshaphat. And it's a very interesting telling thing. It says a archer from the enemy's side drew a bow at random, yeah. let it fly, and guess who it hit? Yeah. Ahab, between the joints of the arm. God's arrows don't miss their target. Yeah. Yeah. And Jehoshaphat is standing in the battlefield surrounded by the Syrians, and what does he do? He cries out to the Lord. Because he has an inheritor. He doesn't know how to handle it. He doesn't know what to do. All he says, Lord, help me. And God diverted the Syrians. And they 
Ahab was struck. Jehoshaphat is out of the battlefield, and he arrives safely home. Ahab is mortally wounded. By the time the sun is set, Ahab dies. Reversal. Even though Ahab had it all worked out, orchestrated to his advantage, God took advantage of that. That's chapter 18. Jehoshaphat arrives back in Jerusalem, chapter 19, and a fellow by the name of Jehu comes in and says, Why did you join yourself with those who hate the Lord? You know, for these things, you've suffered your consequences. That was the, that was the real you know, part that really hit the heart of Jehoshaphat. So in chapter 19, he changes his life around, he cleans up, and he goes out there and he, and he reestablishes the nation of Israel. It's a wonderful story of restoration. Chapter 17 starts out good, huge dip, 18, chapter 19, he gets restored. Now we come to chapter 20, and Jehoshaphat is minding his own business, and all of a sudden he gets a report in verses 1 and 2 of a huge problem. And what is the problem? That's the first thing in verses 1 and 2. It happened after this that the people of Moab and the people of Ammon and others with them beside the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat, and they came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea from Syria, which is in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. And if you've ever been to Israel, this is the area of the Dead Sea. The area of Dead Sea has huge mountain cliffs, and uh, it's very rocky terrain. And these three enemies, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the inhabitants of Mount Seir, they're later identified, some of the other uh, Ammonites, they used those mountains to avoid detection and came in and sprung on King Jehoshaphat. So the report comes back, there's a big problem here. Now our theme for the week is help and hope through hard times. Standing on the promises of God. And there are times that we are going along, we might have suffered in the past because of our own foolish decisions. Other times we're just minding our own business, doing what we're supposed to do, and all of a sudden we're hit with problems, in this case threefold. Catches us by surprise. Comes right upon us. I remember one time preaching someplace, and I had the uh, chairman give an announcement about someone who was involved in a car accident. They go out for a I don't know, maybe a, a loaf of bread and some milk, a gallon of milk at the local store, go through the intersection, collided with an asphalt truck, the truck tipped over, poured the asphalt over the car and into the car, third degree burns on that person. Going out for a, an errand, and all of a sudden this comes up. Not because necessarily a punishment from God, it's just the way life is. And this is what happened here with Jehoshaphat. His life is in order, and yet he still has problems. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, David said, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. That's what's going to happen here with Josh. Yes. So there's the problem in verses 1 and 2. And uh, these problems come around and kind of spring on us when we're not even uh, aware of them. We didn't have advance warning. He didn't have advance warning. So what does he do? What, what does he do? What do you do when, you're hit the, when you hit these problems like Josh had? I'll tell you what he did. The next thing he did is he went right to prayer. That's what we need to do as well. Verses 3.13 is a long prayer. And he starts out, he gathers people together. Don't forget to have people praying for you, interceding for you. That's the idea behind intercessory prayer for one another. Jehoshaphat feared, and he set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. What happened in chapter 18? When the problems came around, at first he went to Ahab and made a marriage alliance. He didn't go right to the Lord. But he learned his lesson out on the battlefield, and then he called upon the Lord. And so now he's learned his lesson. And so these problems threefold come against him. These inhabitants of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir. And they come, and he now takes the matter to the Lord. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not take it to the Lord in prayer. That's the way to say it, right? And so uh, this time he learned his lesson. So he takes his matter before the Lord. Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. So everybody's involved. Prayer, united prayer, corporate prayer. They come from all the cities of Judah and stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and the house of the Lord before the new court. He starts calling out to the Lord. What does he do? There's two things he does which is very important when we come to prayer. Especially
in the context of the trials and tribulations that we go through. The first thing is to recall how God has helped in the past. He, he starts laying it all out. Lord, didn't you say you would take care of these problems? I mean, while we were coming through the wilderness and these people came out to attack us, you told us to keep our hands off them and keep on going to the promised land. And it says here, now here they are again, verse 11, rewarding us, quote unquote, by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you've given them. We could have wiped them out a long time ago. But they're coming in. So he's recalling the past. He's saying, God, didn't you do these things? The first thing he's doing is recalling the past, how God had helped them out. Now, for years, one of my first introductions to Ocean Grove was the Gothard Seminar over here in the auditorium for years and many years. And I remember Bill Gothard talking about making a little book of remembrance, of keeping like a little journal, what God has done for you and helped you out in life. You know, there's a way that we forget those things. God has come through over and over and over again, and 20 years down the road, something happens, we're like, oh Lord, don't you love me anymore? We could have had a long journal as big as the Encyclopedia Britannica of all the goodness and grace acts of God toward us. We forget those things. And Jehoshaphat is praying out and he's recalling the past. But not only that, he is praying the promises. He's recalling the past and he's recalling the promises. That's what this series is all about. The promises of God. He says in verse 7, Are you not our God, who drove out the inhabitants of the land before your people Israel, gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever, and they dwell in it, built you sanctuary? Verse 10, Here are the people, uh, the inhabitants of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, and they're rewarding us. Oh God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And so he's praying the past experiences, and he's praying the promises of God. So no matter what it is, in this audience, as many people as there are in this audience here this morning, there are problems we all go through, whether it's personal, psychological, or what, mental, whether it's financial, or marital, I mean, there's a long list. But we all have problems, and we all need to take these things to the Lord. I don't know, I, I could focus on one and miss a whole bunch of other people here, but if we just take the general principle, taking our matters to the Lord in prayer like the opposite did and getting others involved. Intercessory prayer, that's a help. Here's just a word about that. I find a lot of times when people have problems, they don't really want to share them necessarily, open themselves up. They ask somebody, would you mind praying for me and having a problem in this area? But you know, you have someone praying with you or others praying with you, they can keep it confidential. You can share that with them. That goes a long distance with the things of the Lord. So the prayer in verses 3 through 13. Now the next thing is the promise. What is the promise? And that's uh, what we read in verse 14. Let's look at that section together. When all these things are hitting a crescendo, it says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehoshaphat. Who initiated this? God did. The Spirit of the Lord came upon this person, Jehaziah. <coughs> The son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, and all these other names, in the midst of the assembly, verse 15, he said, Listen, all you of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, you King Joshua, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Sounds familiar, right? It should. Tomorrow, he says, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle position or set yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. We talked about this. Standing still, sitting still, being still before the Lord, letting the Lord at work. And so Jehoshaphat, in verse 18, it says, bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites and the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord, God of Israel, with voices loud and high. And so this promise, this prayer, let's, let's go back to the beginning. This problem led to prayer. It led to recalling the promises of God. And then leads, obviously, to praise. And so Jehoshaphat is being told, this is for you. 
God uses this person, Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, to bring this in. He is coming in with encouraging words. Now, if you just take a look for a second, turn a page back, and you see chapter 19, God used Jehu to bring the reprimand. This is what happens in the school of God. God raises up some people to remind you of your faults. There's a lot of people out there that do that. But oh, how wonderful that God also raises up people to be an encouraging word to you in the midst of your difficulty and your problems. You know, I like that type of ministry, the encouraging ministry. You will never lack for friends if you have a word to share from the Lord in due season. You will never lack for friends. You know what? People will gravitate towards you. People love to hear your encouragement. This is not saccharine sweet. This is not telling untruths. This is an encouraging word. It is a way that uh, you can you can even correct somebody, but do it in such an encouraging way that they're they're like Paul said. He hasn't given me words of destruction, but words for edification. He says that in the Corinthian passages. So try to be a Jehaziel. I mean, there's every now and then you need to have someone who's not listening. You've got to be a Jehu to them. But Jehaziel is an encouraging person. And we think of Barnabas in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He was the son of consolation. Wasn't he? he was a counselor, son of consolation. He's the one that restored John Mark back to ministry. Remember that? Acts chapter 13. John Mark goes after the Apostle Paul. He's got to serve the Lord. He's on the field for a little bit of time, and all of a sudden he's off the field. And we don't hear anything about John Mark until later on after Barnabas took time with him and spent time with him and brought him back apparently to where he should be serving the Lord. And then Paul writes back and says, bring Mark, John Mark, he's profitable to me for the ministry. Wonderful ministry to be an encourager of God's people, like Jehoshaphat. And so the problem of prayer, the promise is, you're going to get the idea that this preacher here is a pea shooter, right? I'm a pea shooting, pea shooting preacher, all my alliterations with the letter P. So the promise is given, the praise comes forth. Let's look at the praise in verse 20 and right down through the end of the chapter. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Joshua stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. That's what is coming from this pulpit here this week. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets. That's like saying, believe his word, and you shall prosper. Not necessarily money-wise, spiritually. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness. God loves holiness. The power of the holy life. And as they went out before the army, they were saying, Praise the Lord, his mercy endures forever. Amen. Just have those, on your, uh, have that, those words on your lips. And uh, the praise of the Lord. You know, it, it says in the scripture, he inhabits the praises of his people. He wants to hear the praise. Because when we praise the Lord, what we are saying in effect, God, there is nothing too hard for you. Amen. You are in this, and I can do these things with your help. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not of my own strength. And so the praise team, if you will, went out. Interesting way to fight a battle, right? This team of people praising the Lord. But look what happened when they praised the Lord. Verse 22. When they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. The people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Mount Seir, they helped to destroy one another. The enemy defeated himself. And the enemy was confounded with the praise of God's people. And you see this all throughout Scripture. Job, when he was hit with all the problems that he experienced in his life, his family and his wealth and his possessions and everything else, he bowed his head in worship. He said, let negative come into the world, negative go out. Blessed 
be the name of the Lord God. And it confounds the enemy. Remember, because Satan wanted to put his hand upon him. And Job praised the Lord. That's what happened. There's power in that praise. And so they came there. In verse 24, they came to the place overlooking the wilderness. And they looked toward the multitude. There they were, the dead bodies fallen on the earth of the enemy. No one had escaped. And Jehoshaphat and his people came. And to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days gathering the spoil because there was so much. You know what I write across that whole paragraph? We do things God's way with the praise of the Lord and His word on our lips. We are greater, more greaterly, greatly enriched after the experience than before. Yeah. That's what happened with God. Don't forget, he had riches and honor and abundance. Chapter 17, reminding him in chapter 18. Reproof against in chapter 19. Now he was enriched, but he was doing it because God had helped him through his trials and his tribulations. And whenever I have noticed in my own experience through the 30-some years I've been a Christian, whenever I go through that valley experience in my life, on the upside of it, there's always a deeper experience for the Lord that I come through because of what God has helped me out with. A deeper understanding of the character of God, His goodness, His grace. Don't forget the fact that says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Years ago, as many of you probably know, there was the uh, was it a hotel, restaurant, whatever, the uh, Sampler Inn was over in this corner over here. I remember going there one, one afternoon, Walking through the cafeteria style, uh, you know, setup that was there. I remember walking along and taking my food items and seeing up on the wall a sampler, and it was from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I looked at that and I said, oh, that's very nicely done. I looked back at the bottom of it, and I think somebody had done that back in the 1800s. I think I saw a little thing. I said, there is a proof that God's word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's the living word. He gave some help and blessing to some person who is on ocean ground, ocean grows grounds and property a hundred and probably at that point twenty years ago. The blessing of God's word. And it was a blessing to me as I was going through the food line and getting my food. It's the living word of God. It pulsates with the very richness of God's treasures and blessings. And so why would we ever keep this book shut? We need to study this word and stand on the promises of God's word. No matter what the problem is, be encouraged by God's precious word. So what happens, we're greatly enriched when we do. We praise the Lord for all these things. And so verse 26 <coughs> says that on the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Baraka. That means literally the place of blessing. There's churches that have the name of Baraka because they want to, you know, emulate this. There they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of the place was called the Valley of Baraka unto this day. And then they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat in front of them to go back to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. God said he would do that. This was an example of it. So they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord, and the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of, uh, of Israel. Then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest all around. And so what's the final component of this? The peace that passes all understanding. The chapter opens up with this bad news of problems crowding out surrounding Jehoshaphat. And so instantly, rather than resorting to his own strategic plan like Jacob did in his life many times, instead he brought the matter to the Lord in prayer. He got other people involved in praying. He starts recalling God's work in his past, how God is faithful and did all these things in the past. And then recalling the promises of God, not letting any of them drop to the ground. And then through that whole cathartic experience is an element of praise that comes through. God, you can take care of this issue. You can take care of this problem. 
And as he follows the Lord in this pattern, there is that praise and that peace that passes all understanding. And that's what God calls us to as well. That's why the promises of God are exceeding great and precious promises, just as Peter talked about. And so that's my question to you. Don't forget, he protects us for looking at the focusing on as a subtitle of his presence uh, with me, and he'll keep us as the apple of his eye, highest under the shadow of your wings, the psalmist cried out. But I love Psalm 27. We've got pavilion right down the ocean pathway right there. I think of this verse all the time. For the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me, and he shall set me up upon a rock. And then that great verse from 1 Peter chapter 5. Take this home with you this morning. But may the God of all grace, don't forget, there's seven of those God of in the New Testament. He's the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you've suffered a while, we don't like going through it, but after you've suffered a while, he will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And I find it very interesting that our chairperson, when they were opening the prayer, used that word twice, not even knowing that we were speaking about this topic this morning. God was presenting and preparing the path for these very words. So may the Lord bless you today as you go forth with these words and these principles, these concepts in mind from God's precious word as a strengthening effect in our own walk with Christ. And may the Lord bless you as you go. Just one little quick word. Uh, at 1.30 this afternoon, we're going to have a meeting at the pavilion speaking on the power of God. Rich Benitez will be the speaker. That's at 1.30. Anyone's welcome. Then at 7 o'clock, there's this concert with a fellow who went through the life of drugs. He was on heroin. His heart stopped, and it revived him again. He was a contemporary with Dion DiMucci, which was the teen idol from the 50s, you know, the wanderer and all that. He approached Dion DiMucci. He says, why do you have this Bible? And Dion says, I became a Christian. And Dion's own words, he said, these are the words of the line, I was sitting in those leather seats, miserable, incomplete. And he came to know Christ the Savior, Dion did. And then Dion led this man to the Lord. And he'll be singing here tonight at 7 o'clock, taking some of the songs that you know and changing them around and singing to the glory of the Lord. So if you'd like to join us, 7 o'clock right there on tonight. Praise the Lord for that. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you again for this audience. We pray your blessing on our words that were spoken today, the scriptural words that remind us again of your great promises. Bless us, Father, as we go out. We pray in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.